Lecture 14, Luke 2, 8 through 32, the gospel is revealed to the insignificant. Let me open up a prayer. God, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for who we are. Thank you for allowing us to be faithful in you, even though when we're unfaithful, you still give us a chance to be faithful. Thank you for being faithful to us. Thank you, Lord, for this Sunday morning and for all the other Sunday mornings that we've lived through and haven't thanked you for. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. So we've been discussing for 13, 14 weeks now, and I don't, don't remember which one, where we're at. Um, the question that I posed in week one was, what if? <clears throat> and with this question also came a, uh, a thesis statement, per se, or, or a subtitle. What would be the message of the New Testament if it only consisted of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Right? So what would be the message of the New Testament if it only consisted of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So basically, we're trying to discover what exactly is the gospel, right? What, what is this? What, is, what are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John telling us what the Bible is? And this is a very uh, powerful question, very poignant question. Because you got to think about it. Have you ever wondered, like, what's the point of the Bible? Like, that's, that's a great question, right? You know, like, like, what is... Okay, if I just knew what God was trying to tell me to do, if he just made it simple, yeah, <laughs> then I would just get that thing together, and I wouldn't have no more problems, because I would, just, if he could just make it plain, you, you, you have, you have, yeah, right, amen, you ever wondered about your life too, if he would just tell me what my purpose is, then I would just get right in the right place, and, and I wouldn't have any problems anymore, so, and so basically, what does, since we call them the Gospels, and which they are, what, what are these Gospels, what, what is this one Gospel that is split into four, telling us. And that's what we've been discovering. And so we did Matthew, we did Mark, and now we're in Luke. And I want to turn to Luke chapter 2 today, <clears throat> and I want to do a little reading, more reading than what I normally do. But I want you to see or, or hear at least what's going on. I'm going to start at verse 8 and pass the temple. I'm going to have you pick up after me, if you don't mind. I want you to read verses 22 through 32, okay? And yeah, in Luke, Luke chapter 2, 22 through 32. And then I'm going to read verses 2, I mean, ch verses 8 and, and following. And then the second, two, uh, what did I just say? 22 through 32. Thank you. That's what I want you to read. Now, now, do me a favor and read this, listen to this here, but I want you to use your imagination and build the world, build what you, what you hear with your brain. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field. So I want you to put your mind with some shepherds in the field. I want you to smell these shepherds and, and, and recognize what they're walking through. And is it hot outside? Is it day or night? Let, let's find out. Keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring good news of great joy will be for all people, for unto you, born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. <clears throat> and this will be a sign for you. <clears throat> this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory, to God the highest, on and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away um, from there, they went into heaven, and the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. And I'll stop reading right there. And if you don't mind, 22 to 32. And when the day of her purification according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This is coming from the King James Version. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose 
name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death, for he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the pan brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law. Then took he him up in his arm and blessed God and said, Lord, now let it thy, thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Yes, Lord. Which thou hast prepared before the faith of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people. I sure appreciate you. Thank you very much, Pastor Timber, for reading that. So let me, there were so many things that happened here. I want to repeat some key words that I really want you to follow. So let's go back to Luke chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 8. And I'm, I'm going to set this picture because I know, I, I know uh, for some of you. First, let me thank all of you for being here, new and old. We definitely appreciate you. Let me make this very plain for you. If you have a, if you have a subtitle on your, on your Bible, it'll tell you the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, what I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying to get you to understand that Christ was not Jesus' last name. <clears throat> that's, that's what's, I want you to understand that first and foremost, that there, Luke is presenting to us the birth of the Christ. But what does that mean? So let, let me give you some key words. Verse 10, it says, the angel, so this is a representative of God, <clears throat> tell, told them to fear not. Okay, this is not the first time God has showed up or a messenger of God has showed up. And then told the people, don't fear. In the ancient world, when you met God, the proper response was fear and awe. Right? So our word awesome, which we misuse today, literally meant to be full of awe, to, to, to be, uh, yeah, reverence. Right? So when you, so, so <clears throat> Judges chapter 7. Gideon is, is cowering behind some, some wheat, and the angel says, you mighty man of valor, while he is afraid and cowering behind some wheat. And, and also in, in Luke, Mary is told, you're going to have birth to this king that's going to live, and Mary is afraid, and the angel says, fear not. So whenever you meet God, the, the, the proper response was fear or, or reverence. Now, I'm, I'm afraid to, I'm very afraid to let us all know we don't do that anymore. Like, that's, that's not us. We don't, because, and this is why I've been stressing so much in, in, in my church, an encounter with God. See, I'm, I am so afraid of God that I, I can't, no matter what you do to me, I can't do to you what you've done to me. Amen. Because I feel, fear God that much. It doesn't matter if I get you and you can't. I know God is. Does that make sense? Like, like because when God puts his hands on me, I'm not just losing, I'm not just getting a black eye. That, that, that's, that's way too easy. I'm losing my finances, my health. I'm, <laughs> I'm losing a whole bunch of stuff. By the time the Lord finishes with me, I would have lost way more than I made you lose. So, so, so one of the key words here, I, I need you to understand, this is a, this is, like, so let's, let's erase out your mind anything in the Bible. You don't know anything about justification by faith. You've never met Paul. Because, and this, this, is, this is serious because, because there was no Google in the, the first century. There, there, was no, there was no search engines. There was no internet. So you can literally live in a, a, a Lucan community or, or Luke, but in, in, an adju, in an adjectival said, you can, you, can, you can live in a Luke community and never in your life have read Matthew. Never in your life have read Mark. You could have lived in Luke's community and only had Luke's gospel. And all you had of the New Testament, as we know it, is what Luke said. And that would totally reshape your theology. You wouldn't know anything about Jerusalem. You wouldn't know anything about the new Jerusalem coming down and replacing the earth. You wouldn't know anything about Revelation because all you would have is Luke's. And then everybody couldn't read. You live in a society in which... Most of society is literate. Most of you, like, if you ever, have you ever, everybody, everybody here ever browsed the internet, right, before? So I need you to understand that that would never have happened in the 15th century. Not because not of technology, 
because people couldn't read in the 15th century. Everybody reads now. The internet is mostly something you read. It, it's, it's like 80% textual. You, sure, you can watch some videos, but that's on YouTube or things like that. Most of your internet, if, if you take a test in high school, the first thing you have to do in order to take the test, forget high school, the first thing you have to do in the first grade in order to take the test is you got to read the instructions. Does that make sense? In order for you to know how to solve this problem, the, it, it, so in order for you to properly solve a math problem, you must first cognitively deduce the English problem, which is the answer, I mean the question that you must answer. So in order to do math, you got to do English first. Well, we live in that society. In the first century, there was none of that. If, if you can read, you were, you were wealthy and you were lucky, and then you would read to a bunch of people. Now, now, now watch this here, because there's fear, but let's back up a little bit. Let's, let's, cause I just read to you verse 10, but let's go back to verse 8. And in the same region, now what, what was this region? This region was discussed in chapter 1, but it's a poor region. Just, let me just tell you that. There were shepherds out in the field keeping the flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone down around them and were filled with great fear. Now, don't get bored because here's where it's about to get very exciting. If you had some Bible knowledge, what was David? What was, what was David's occupation before he was a king? Uh, interesting. So David was a shepherd before he was king. Now watch this here. This king that's getting ready to be born appears not to kings. L I need you to, L Lord have mercy. Listen, Jesus, let me, let me paint the picture. According to Hebrews chapter 6, 7, and 8, especially 8, you'll find out that Jesus Christ was already king. Before he ever came to earth, he was already in heaven on, on the throne. He was already robed in majesty. He was already filled with glory. He was so much of king that the angels just cried out, holy, holy, holy. You can find that in Isaiah chapter 6. Jesus was king, left all this royalty to come to earth to be a peasant. Now, now just, just, just let me, let me, let me, let me just, let me be truthful with you, because I think I said this before, but let me say it again. It's not just the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross that's impressive. The mere fact that he came down here is impressive. Because let me tell you something. Let me, let me no, don't, don't let this, I don't even know how much this suit costs, but it's expensive. Don't let this suit fool you. Don't, <laughs> don't, um, don't, 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 don't let that. Don't, I would not, if, if I had to be the Christ, none of us would be here. Let me just tell you, the, the Bible would be written a lot differently. And I know as I, 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 got, I got pretty decent character. Daisha will tell you I've changed a mighty long way. Amen. I, I, I've changed. And I'm telling all y'all, <laughs> I'm telling all y'all, ain't no way in the world I would have sat on the cross. Yeah. I would have, my ego would have made me, my ego would have made me go, well, hold on, let me tell y'all something. You know, I, I would have got off the cross. Let me, let me, let me tell y'all something. Since you, did, since you thought I was up here weak, let me show you how strong I am and I'd have killed everybody, right? But forget all that. Let's, before we get to the cross, let's just get to the fact that Jesus gave up royalty Amen. to be a peasant. So I, I, would've, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even did that. Like, it wouldn't even, I wouldn't even came to earth. Because Think about it now. Now, I want you to think about this realistically. Because here's what Luke is trying to show you with this gospel. Think, think about it. Luke is trying to show you with this gospel in this manner. Jesus gave up everything. And the first thing he does is get born around shepherds. Okay, that, that to a 21st century, you, you, you're so disconnected from shepherds, you don't understand. Shepherds are not making money. That's, 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 they, they're poor. They're, they're very poor, and they stink. Amen. Okay? If your job is to be outside in the heat all day long, you probably don't smell good. Amen? Amen? But not just that. We're talking about first century in which you had, you possibly took one bath a year. Amen. Okay, okay I want you to let's just check this out. There were, there's no running water. There's, there, there's, no, there's no central air and heat. There's no 
There's no, there's no plumbing. If you were to take a bath, you would have been royalty. You would not have been somebody. You know what I'm saying? Like Pharaoh's daughter would take baths. It would not be a shepherd. Not only were you poor, but you stinked. And so Jesus Christ comes and be and the first people to witness him being born are not kings. They're poor people. Now, now, now let me see if I can break this down a little bit more. If 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 I was to put my ego back into the situation, and believe me, I have one. If I'm already king and I gotta come to earth, well, I need to come to earth. As the baddest man on planet Earth. Does that make sense? Like, <laughs> like I'm not going to lose everything just to, you, you understand what I'm saying? And so it goes on and it goes forth and it goes forth. And now, so let's, let's pay attention to, to some more. Yeah, yeah, y'all go ahead. Let's pay attention to some more key words. And so it says here in verse 9, no, verse 11, for unto you born this day, where? City of David, this, this, this Jerusalem area, era, this, this Bethlehem, right? All this here is where David was making his capital. All David, David was reigning, right? But why? And watch what, they, watch what Luke calls Jesus. For unto you is Christ the Lord. Interesting. See, he's not, he didn't just give him his messianic title. He also gave him his, his kingly role. For unto you, remember I tell you, every time you hear Christ, you need, to, you need to automatically in your word, in your mind, understand it's king. So he didn't just say, unto you, Jesus is born. He says, unto you is born Christ, the king who is the Lord. Amen. They've been waiting for a long time to hear these words. And so when, now, now think about this here. When you're born, if, if, if you were going to, if you had to set the world straight, this, this is, the, this is the, 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 the majesty of our God. If you had to set the world straight and you had one shot to do it, wouldn't you just go all the way to the top and make, because if I wanted to change America, I need to go to Washington, D.C., make some changes. Does that make sense? Because this, this is the, the head of the country. But but God says no. No, 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 no. This revolution starts with the people and it starts from within. I'm going to overthrow this world not by showing myself power with the powers. I'm going to overthrow this world by showing myself gracious with the people. That's powerful. That's powerful cuz if you and I wanted to take over a foreign country the, what we need to do as far as a battle strategy is we need to attack the capital of whatever that country is. Does that make sense? Like that, that's how you do it. You, 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 you knock off the head, the body will follow. Does that make sense? Well, Jesus Christ says, and God says, listen, let me go to the lowly people. I, let me go to Mary. Let, let, let me go to, to Joseph. People who are completely insignificant and let me make them significant. This is in Luke's entire gospel. It's all about flipping the status quo. It is all about, as a matter of fact, you're going to hear a uh, 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 Mary song here in a little bit, but Luke's entire gospel is women are low, let me lift them. Men are low, let me lower them. The Pharisees are high, let me lower them. Right? The, the, the peasants are low, let me lift them. And now you have it to where the king is arriving on planet earth, but not just arriving. It's a divine arrival. It is an arrival like that has never been seen ever before on planet Earth and will never be seen again in such a pleasant way. Because the next time he's coming, we know he's coming in a whole different way. <laughs> Amen. Right. And so if if I was to do it, I would make sure my king immediately sits on uh, Rome's throne. But God says, no, 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 that's 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 not the way I want to do it. Let me let my king be shown to shepherds, people who are insignificant, people who don't matter. But since they matter to me, I'm going to make sure they matter to my king. Amen. 
That's powerful because you ought to be very glad that because none of us are kings in this room. None of us are millionaires. But yet God continues to show up to us day in and day out. We are insignificant to many people in the, in the White House. We are insignificant. We ain't got to go to the White House. You're insignificant to the mayor of this city. Until it's voting time, you are insignificant. We mean nothing. And God says, but yes, you do. Amen. And that's powerful. It's powerful that you can be sitting in your hospital bed and your whole family forget about you, but the Lord never leaves your side. I wish I had somebody. Amen. It's powerful that this, this God shows up to shepherds, but then these are shepherds in David's city. And, 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 and now they are not, they have to be announced. Actually, let's, let's watch their response. So their response is, so the angels are already recognizing that this is, of course, Luke calls him David, a savior who is the Christ the Lord. But, but watch, watch how this works. When the angels went away, verse 15, um, the shepherds said to one another, the shepherds, let us go over the Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. You should be. A big piece of this gospel, a big piece of this, because it's trapped here. It's here, and it seems insignificant in these words. But the Holy Spirit doesn't place words inside Scripture in order for them to be insignificant. So these shepherds are looking at what has just happened, and they say amongst themselves, let us go, and then let us go see what this thing that has been done in Bethlehem, which is still, you know, the house of bread, this, this is still David's area, and what the Lord has shown. There you go. You caught it. Amen. Right? Th this Christianity is a revealed religion. I don't care how much, I don't, you, can go to school. I don't, you can go to school. Until the Lord reveals to you his truth, your school means nothing. Amen. Amen. Right? You can... You can, you, you would never be, now there's a such thing as natural revelation. There is. That you, like you can look at the stars and recognize that there is a God. You, you, you have no choice because you can look at stars, you can look at the trees, you can go, wow, there has to be some higher being that made this possible. Look at all the complexities and space and, and you can look at the human body, you can look at the atoms, you can go, wow, something had to Something had to kickstart this emotion and something has to keep containing it. That's natural revelation. What you can never do, this is called special revelation, is you can never look at the stars and go, Jesus died for me. Whew, that gave me chills. Lord have mercy. Right? You, can, you, can, you, can never, you can never look at uh, the atom and the, and, and, and the intricacies of the atom and what's inside of it and the protons and neutrons and all that stuff and go, Jesus died for me. No, 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 no. In order for you, you can recognize that there, is, there has to be a higher being, a higher intelligence, but what you would never recognize is that this higher intelligence came down and died for you mm -hmm. and rose for you so you can rise again. That is special revelation. Mm -hmm. That's something you can't just get by being a mere observer. That's something in which the Lord has to reveal and show to you. So let's go back to this here because Deacon, Deacon Aaron gets it. He literally these, these, let us go over the Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. Watch it. Which the Lord has made known to us. Whatever this gospel is, God made it known to us. We didn't get it. We didn't see it, and we certainly don't control it. But God, in his graciousness, reveals us, to us, his great plan. That's powerful, because, because, because here's the deal. Let, 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 now, I want you, I've been putting my ego in it. I want all of you to put your ego in it. Right, so to take, out your, take out your Christianity. I want you to think about your ego, because we're all men, and we have one. And I want you to think about the fact that God shows this grace, this, this, God reveals his king to people who don't matter. That, 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 that's what this text is saying. This text is saying to shepherds, they, they're insignificant. They have no money. These shepherds have no power to change the world. 
Because if you're going to reveal, if I want to change something, I, want, I would want to make the change happen to the people who can do something about it. Does that make sense? Like if I, if I, if I, if I wanted to, like if I want to change the way America operates in which it needs to change, amen, right? I need to go influence people, politicians, and bankers who are running the world so I can get this change to happen. Does that make sense? What I'm not going to do is go find a janitor at a, in a small city, in a small ISD, and say, janitor, I have a master plan to change the world. Let's talk about it. Does that make sense? Now, at no point am I trying to talk about janitors, but I'm just trying to, I'm trying to equate to you, uh, like, I'm trying, to, you know, I'm trying to take this 21st century perspective, and I'm trying to throw it back into the first century. I need for you to see that we don't respect janitors no more than they respect the shepherds. Amen, right? Or, or maybe it's a garbage man. Okay, so I'm not I'm not running behind the garbage truck, and so and, it, and this is best. This I mean this is this is this is a small poor area. So I'm not running around um, a garbage truck in Jewett, Texas, which is a very small city in Texas that barely has paved roads. I'm not running to Jewett, Texas, to say, hey, let's change the world. Does that make sense? But that's what God does. For, for, for whatever unknown reason, God says, listen, I, I have a significant mission, but I'm going to give it to everybody that you call insignificant, and I'm going to empower them for the rest of human history to make them significant. Amen. It is not the people, it is, it is not, it, it's, it's the pastor temples of the world that are affecting the daily lives of, of, of sheep. Amen. It is not the presidents. You know what I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say anything wrong with being president or anything like that. I'm just saying that when I want to change the world, most people, when I want to change the world, a football coach has a lot of power to change lives. All of us remember that one coach that really did change our lives because he taught us to do some things. And, and, and it was a sad day when that coach died and the funeral, the church was packed because Coach Washington died because that coach affected little boys all day long, every year after year, 25, four sets or three sets of generations. This coach was always changing lives of little people, insignificant people, people who couldn't even vote. It's not the presidents that do prison ministry, it's preachers. Lord have mercy, I'm trying to help somebody, amen. But it's not just preachers that do prison ministry, it's this laity. But what, what I'm simply saying is the people in prison can't vote. They, they have no rights. Yet there are people who are saying, I know you think these people are insignificant, but God says they matter. Amen. So I say they matter Amen. and I have a word for them. Amen. Right. Amen. And this is how God. This, so, 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 so this is how Luke portrays this gospel. Luke portrays this gospel that. The arrival of the Christ, the arrival of the king who is the savior, he arrives to people who life says doesn't matter. Amen. But, the, but, but wouldn't you, like, so let's, let's, just, let's just look at some evidence and we're getting ready to close. The evidence suggests if God shows up to people who don't matter, that means they actually do matter. Amen. Amen? This is why you can have a little church with really big God inside of it. Amen. Amen. And why you can have big churches with little God inside of it. <laughs> there was, there was, so, well, but, but, but before I give you the close of the illustration, there was this, th this king, this, this, this Christ is so much of a big deal that a man, and this is what Pastor, Tim, Tim, Pastor Temple read, named Simeon, prayed to the Lord, listen, don't, don't take me until I see the arrival of your king. Now, what does, now, now, understand, this is the temple, right? They go to the temple. Now, a king belongs in the temple. I wish I had somebody. Amen. Right? Like, if, if, if you're going to, right, if, if, if you don't think that matters, Haggai. Haggai chapter 2. You'll find out in which the, they rebuild the temple. Amen. And then the people weep who were still alive enough to, to know what Solomon's temple looked like. And the text, in fact, let, let, let's go to that. Let's, let's go to that. I want to. Haggai chapter 2. Let's go to that. Yeah, Haggai chapter 2. I want to show you how powerful. I want to show you 
what God is doing. God does all these little intricate details and things. So Haggai chapter 2, right before Zechariah. So in the seventh month, um, in the seventh month, the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet. Speak now, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the Joshua of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people who say, who, watch it now, this is Haggai chapter 2, verse 3, who, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? All right? They're talking about the temple. They just rebuilt the temple. And then, past the temple, won't you pick up from verse 3 all the way um, to verse 9. Verse 3 of King James. Mm -hmm. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, said the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josiah, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, said the Lord, and work, for I am with you, said the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I convened, convened with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Fear ye not, for thus said the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heaven and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill the house with glory, says there you the go. Lord. Right there. Hope. There you go. Right there. Now, then he says, this house will have more glory than that former house that you found beautiful. Why? So, put a pin in that. And let's go back to Luke chapter 2. This, this Simeon is saying, I won't die until I see your Christ being born. Now, let me paint the picture. These people in Haggai wept. This is about 600 years or something, something like that before Jesus Christ. They wept because the temple that was just reconstructed was not as beautiful as the temple that was first constructed. And the older generation wept because they still remembered Solomon's temple. And then God says, how many of you recognize this temple and remember? And what is, what is this temple now to your eyes? Nothing. This, this, this is what Haggai says. But then God says, but, but, but fear not, because in a little bit, I'm going to shake the world. I'm going to shake the foundation. And he says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine. And in this glory, right, he says, in, in this house, I am going to give to you more glory than ha has ever happened through this second house because why? Here's why. It happens in Luke chapter 2. Because Jesus Christ, the, the text says, I'm going to fill this house with glory. Why? Because this is the temple Jesus is going to walk through. Lord have mercy. Amen. 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 So I need to get it now. So, yeah, sure. You had Solomon's temple. But my Christ never walked in that way. But the one you call insignificant, my Christ is going to walk through. Lord have mercy. And so Luke is playing with all of this. Luke is saying, listen, I get it. I get that all this is insignificant. But don't you remember that our God has been making insignificant things significant for a mighty long time. Amen. Amen. And, and, and so basically, the first blood that was ever shed by Jesus Christ was not shed on the cross. It was actually shed at the temple on the eighth day. Amen. Because that's what you had to do to male boys. You had to circumcise them. Amen. And, 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 it's, and it's glorious that this, this, this insignificant Simeon, um, who was more significant than the, than the shepherds, these insignificant shepherds get known first. This significant God shows himself in glory to insignificant people over and over and over again, but he chooses them first. Amen. This is why Luke will always tell you, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. There's the story. Let us capture what Luke 
is actually saying with an illustration. It was told to me when I was at Houston Baptist University, an undergraduate. One day, the pastor filled up helium balloons, and he gave it to a 300-member congregation. And he told the congregation, when you feel the presence of the Lord, release the balloon. And of course, helium being helium, the balloon would rise to the top. And so as worship would happen, one or two people released their balloons. And by the end of the service, from worship to the sermon, over two-thirds of the congregation still had their balloons in their hands because they never felt the presence of God in the church. Amen. And I'm afraid because we don't recognize what the gospel is that most of our church services never actually have the presence of God present. Amen. And, and I would hope that we live a life in which we can release the balloon this Sunday because for Christ to have been in heaven and then to come down and be a, pre a peasant and then show himself to all who are insignificant and simultaneously make them significant, that's enough to know how good he has been. And when we know that then, it should show up in us now. And wherever we think about that, the presence of God actually is. Let me pray. God, thank you that you are revealing to us more uh, than we may have known. God, we bless you. We appreciate you. Now help us to get to the point in which we recognize the presence of you inside our church services. Now here's the deal. There was no organs in the first century. So we don't need an organ. Not to say that's a bad thing. We don't need 500 members. As you say where there's two or three gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. So God, if we can, if you're being the midst with two or three, then you should theoretically be in the midst of every single church in America. Please let us get refocused and have your presence, that of the king, in our presence. Because where there is a king, Every knee shall bow. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.